Hello and welcome to Global Connections on ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm Patrick Bratton, uh, filling in for Carlos Juarez in his normal slot. A couple of weeks ago, we talked to uh, War Carlos Juarez, who was in Romania on doing some research, and he talked to us about the EU migration crisis. Today, we're going to shift things and talk about, about a more historical, but also more local topic, uh, talking with one of my colleagues from HBU, who's going to talk to you about some of the history of Iolani Palace and um, some of the events that are going on there now. So it was my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dr. Doug Aspen, Associate Professor of History at Hawaii Pacific University. Welcome to ThinkTech. Thank you. Is this your first time on ThinkTech? This is my first time on ThinkTech, yes. Excellent, yes. excellent. Okay. Good to have you here. So you are a, a person who specializes in both Spanish and Hawaiian history. Yes, that, I guess you could say that, yeah. Okay. It's an interesting combination. It is an interesting, what brought you, what's, what's the sort of the, the thing that got you doing both of those things? Well, I was studying for my graduate work in European history and I was uh, basically got put into the area of 19th century Spain. That was my specialty area. And I was, uh, research was mainly on monarchism mm -hmm. in Spain in the 19th century. And so that kind of ties in with Hawaii's 19th century monarchy. So mm -hmm. that's kind of, I think, the tie-in is the interest in monarchy. Okay, interesting. And you yourself have Hawaii roots, which also explains your interest, Yes, right? and so, yes, I was born and raised here, and um, so I had a connection to Hawaii even before my mm -hmm. interest in the palace, yeah. Okay, so I have to ask the obligatory question. What school did you go to? Pearl City High School, go Chargers. Good, good, good. All right. Um, so interested in Hawaiian history, Spanish yeah. history, yeah. Uh, looking at that. Um, I've also heard that you have some, in, because of your research that you've done on the monarchy, and you've also have this, you've been a longtime docent at Iwalani yes, Palace, right. uh, that you have done, um, how should we say, you've, got, you've done a lot of service for historical work in Hawaii, right. and particularly with some of the royal orders that are mm -hmm. still around. So I, I, I'm to understand that you've had a special honor or privilege in, recently? Yes, I'm an honorary ali'i in the royal order of Kamehameha I. Um, that is, uh, it's a civic organization. It actually has its origins in the monarchy period with the first order of chivalry of the Kingdom of Hawaii. When, when did that date back to? That's in the 1860s. That was the first Western style order of chivalry. There had been some idea of creating something like this that goes back all the way to the 1840s to the time of Kamehameha III. But the first actual uh, royal order for the kingdom was in the 1860s under Kamehameha V. Okay, interesting. What are some of the things that you that you do uh, with the order uh, now that you're uh, an honorary member? Well, the order does a lot of uh, civic engagement, basically, and so uh, events that are associated with the elite, uh, members of the royal order will be present for that, and as an honorary member, I will sometimes uh, attend some of those ceremonies. It may include uh, royal birthdays mm. and events that commemorate important uh, dates in the monarchy. Okay, interesting. What are some of the things that you've looked at in your research? I mean, some, okay, so you're looking at the Hawaiian monarchy, but there's a lot of things to cover. Um, what are some of the, the topics or, or issues that you've done research? And how do you do research? Is it archives? Where are the archives? Uh, interviews, oral histories? What are you? Well, one of the main things that I'm interested in is the symbols that were used by the Hawaiian monarchy. And when uh, Westerners come to Hawaii and the monarchy becomes increasingly Westernized, you see the adoption of a lot of different Western symbols that mm. might be uh, the royal orders, for instance, that start in the 1860s and then continue on into um, the Kalaa Kabwa period. Then there are also the crown jewels, there are uh, royal flags and such. And these are some of the areas that I'm interested in, is interested in as the monarchy started adopting a lot of the symbols, sort of the uh, trappings of monarchy that were found in Europe. One of the things that kind of strikes me as a non-specialist, this might be um, uh, a question that's off the mark, but I'm always struck in sort of 19th century, the Hawaiian monarchy seemed to have this sort of Anglophilia uh, mm, that happened mm, with the Church mm, of England. Mm, I mean, mm. you know, Baritania Street, the flag. Right, right, uh, right. Was that something that you've uh, come across a lot in, in your work? Yes, there were definitely very strong connections to uh, Great Britain. Of course, the missionaries who came here were from the United States. And so there was a bit of tension between uh, different outside influences. The missionaries were not particularly fond of the... Uh, of the UK for a number of different reasons, for political reasons, but also for religious reasons as well, as the uh, Church of England was a little bit different than the Congregationalist Church uh, that was here. But we see a lot of connections uh, going back all the way to Captain Cook. Of course, Captain mm. Cook was the first 
European that we know for sure was in Hawaii. And when the Europeans came, and we see people like Captain Vancouver of the Royal Navy develop uh, close relations with the Hawaiian monarchy. So through the whole uh, monarchy period, we have a lot of connections between Hawaii and Britain that carry on uh, through the, uh, that entire period. Interesting, interesting. You're talking about the monarchy as well. I mean, we've got a couple of important dates. So you mentioned some of the things that you do, talking about birthdays mm -hmm. and things like that. But we're coming up to something quite big for King yep. Kalakaua, right, yep. in the coming weeks. Exactly. On Monday, November the 16th, this coming Monday, is uh, his birthday. So he was born on November the 16th, uh, 1836. And so there will be some special celebrations at Iolani Palace to commemorate his uh, birth. Okay. Now, are there going to be, uh, in terms of the celebrations, uh, don't they also, in addition, also decorate the palace? Yes, okay. yes. And so every year for the king's birthday, there will be uh, special decorations that we put up. They get put up at different times every year. They usually happen a little bit before the birthday, so mm -hmm. they may be up now. I'm not too sure about that, but if you're on King Street, you can certainly take a look to see if the decorations uh, are up. And those decorations are replicas of what was put up in 1886. Uh, that was Kalaka's 50th birthday. So it's a modern event in that we're celebrating his birthday on Monday, but it's also a recreation, in a sense, of a historical event, which was his 50th jubilee in 1886. Okay, his 50th jubilee yeah. um, for, and for the decoration. I do believe we have a few photos yes, of, the, yes. of the jubilee as well that maybe we can share. These are photos you're, you, you yourself took, right? Yes, these are some photos that I took, the 19th century one I obviously didn't take. But <laughs> uh, this shows the front of the palace uh, for the modern-day recreation of the uh, 1886 Jubilee. Okay, um, and a, a sort of symbolism other than the, the colors of the flag, or are there are there things you talked about uh, symbols and trappings? Yeah. Are there things that our our viewers should uh, pay attention to here? Well, I think the palace is sort of the way it's decorated here is a good way to sort of understand what is happening during the uh, monarchy period. So when you're on King Street and you're driving by and you're wondering what are all of those uh, decorations up there. Uh, and give you a little bit of insight into that. So you can see uh, near the front entrance, there are two very large flags. Mm. And the one on the left is the flag of the Kingdom of Hawaii. It is essentially the same flag that is used by uh, the state of Hawaii today. And then that large flag that you can see on the right-hand side that you probably uh, don't see very often, that is Kalaka was personal standard, so his personal oh. flag. Um, and you can see in the center of the flag is the coat of arms of the Kingdom of Hawaii and then the crown over, uh, over the top as well. So that's probably the most uh, visible symbol that you can see for the king's birthday uh, when the palace is decorated. Okay, interesting. And these look very similar, or it's supposed to be um, a replica of, of the same sort of arrangement that happened in 18, Correct. 1886. Correct. Right? And so one of the things that uh, we've done now for the king's birthday that is an added sort of feature that was just put in last year was the correct flags that fly over the top oh. of the palace. And so in this photo, you can't see those flags, but the other photo shows you some of the new flags that uh, were just put up last year uh, with the new historical information that has come out about those decorations. What, what, I, what was different, if you will, what's different about these flags compared to, so we were, they were flying flags that were not correct for the time period before? Or? Well, before, when this recreation started, it was in 1986, and so it was the 100th anniversary of the Jubilee mm. in, 18, uh, in 1886, in 1986, and at that time, the flags that were flying over the top of the palace were just the flags of the Kingdom of Hawaii. So national flag was flying over all of the towers uh, over the top. And in the photos from the monarchy period, you can't see what flags are flying over the top. And so there had to be a little bit of guesswork that went mm. into uh, what exactly configuration of flags was used for the 1886 Jubilee. But some research that I did uh, from that event gave me more insight into what is actually mm -hmm. uh, what was actually flown in November of 1886. Oh, and I, I do believe we have an, uh, a fo uh, photo from that time period. Yes, we have a photo here, so you can see the front of the palace for the jubilee in 1886 mm -hmm. in November, and you can see that same large white flag with the Hawaiian coat of arms, Kingdom coat of arms, to the 
right of the entrance there, and that is a king's personal standard. You can also see the national flag to the left. But what you can't see is you can't see the flags that are flying over uh, the tower. So back then, people didn't have digital photography, and so didn't maybe necessarily get 500 pictures of this event. There are a number of different pictures of the event, uh, but there are no photos, at least that I'm aware of, that show what was flying over the top uh, of the palace. And so before the uh, new research was done about this, there was some guesswork that had to be uh, done about those flags. How did you find, I mean, where did you find this information? How did you go about A lot it? of this information is in newspapers of the time. And so if you look at the uh, Honolulu newspapers, some of them give a very lengthy description of the mm. palace during the 1886 event. And it's actually from those articles that I was able to get a better sense of what was being flown over the top of the palace on that day. What were some of the newspapers back then? Well, we had the Pacific Commercial Advertiser, and the Pacific Commercial Advertiser was the forerunner of the Honolulu Advertiser. And uh, that newspaper goes back all the way back to the early, uh, the early, the middle part of the 19th century. Mm. It has a long history. It had a variety of different uh, political opinions, some of them very anti-monarchical after a certain period of time. But all of the papers basically covered the royal events in quite a bit of uh, detail. So even if they weren't necessarily always friendly to the monarchy, they did cover uh, they did cover different celebrations that were happening in the palace or throughout the kingdom. Okay, interesting. And so what are some of the things that people, if people wanted to go and, and see the celebration uh, this, this year, I mean, what yeah. would be some of the things that would be happening? Presumably? Well, the celebration is going to be starting about 1130. The highlight of the celebration will be at noon. And so at that time, there will be a royal review. And so you will see the palace decorated, but you'll also see some events uh, beginning around 11.30, including uh, usually the Royal Hawaiian Band, which mm. will be playing some monarchy era music, and of course the uh, kingdom's uh, national anthem, which is our state song, Hawaii Ponoi, will be playing uh, for that event. And then the Royal Review is sort of the highlight of the event. Okay, interesting. And you, I, I, I'm supposing you will be present? I will be present, yes, mm -hmm. I will. Uh, I go every year, actually. I think I've been to at least the last 10 or 12, oh. <laughs> so sometimes it is kind of a trick to be able to get there at the right time and <laughs> scheduling with everything. But it's, uh, I think it's really one of the highlights of the royal calendar, so to speak, mm -hmm. to see the king's birthday at the palace. Okay, quite interesting, quite interesting. Um, when you're looking at these uh, royal flags mm -hmm. and a lot of the, 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 the sort of trappings or symbols mm -hmm. of, of the monarchy, I mean, has there been something for you that's been a, a surprise or something as you research or you sort of rediscovered that you weren't anticipating? Or? I think one of the things that's been surprising about uh, my study of royal symbols, especially about some of the royal flags, is that there is actually information about them. So it's a topic that hasn't really been examined in that much uh, detail. And I was always told as I was looking into this topic that you'll never find anything um, on it because the Hawaiian monarchy was not, uh, wasn't like a monarchy in Europe where you would have had extensive records of all of these types of uh, trappings that the monarchy used. But uh, there were, in fact, records, especially in the newspapers uh, mm. describing some of the flags. And then the actual flags, many of them still do exist uh, today. They're not uh, normally on public display, but they are still in existence. And so there was more information than I think I anticipated finding, mm -hmm. uh, especially on these 19th century royal standards. Interesting. And this also goes back, you, you've got a kind of a, a linkage. I mean, not only are you teaching about Hawaii history mm -hmm. in the classroom, and you're doing research on your own, but you're also doing uh, work as a docent mm -hmm. uh, right, in the right. palace. How did you start becoming a docent at, at the palace? Well, that actually kind of connects to my uh, interest in Spain in a sort of tangential way. Okay. I was, I was uh, here um, doing my dissertation, writing up my dissertation, and basically talking about 19th century Spanish politics every day. And I'd always had an interest in the palace and had been a member of the Friends of Iolani Palace for a number of years. But I decided to actually join the docent program to sort of give me a break from what I was doing when I was writing my uh, dissertation. So it was, uh, there were connections, even though they might not be the connections that you think of. Okay, we're going to take a short break and we'll okay. get right back into talking uh, with Doug Aspen. Okay. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina 
president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, and what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Hello, welcome back to Global Connections on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your guest host, Patrick Bratton, filling in for Carlos Juarez. Here today we're talking about Hawaiian history, history of the monarchy, with Doug Asman, Associate Professor of History at Hawaii Pacific University. So before our break, Doug, you were talking to us about how you kind of you, you kind of got into being a docent at Iolani Palace, um, almost kind of um, not quite tangentially or serendipitously, and particularly to get a break from doing your dissertation right. work. And I think everybody's kind of gone through a doctoral dissertation. You know, your dissertation becomes like, I often give the analogy of the, the pet that you adopt, and then after about six months, you're like, ooh, maybe that wasn't a good idea or something, sure. but you're wedded to the pet, and you've sure. got to take care of it, and sure. then you're kind of... It's like, or like a roommate that <laughs> right, you needed, exactly, maybe, um, exactly. to help pay the bills. But yeah. you're like, why did, I, why did I have a roommate? Right. So you have to kind of live with the... Right. So having a break from the dissertation yes, would be quite yes. nice. So it started... How long ago was that? Did you start? Uh, that was about 15 years ago. So okay. I've been a docent for about 15 years. It seems like... Uh, it was just yesterday, but I guess it's been it's been quite a while. Yeah. How often? I mean, how often do you do that in the week? Once a week? I do it once a week, and mm. so I uh, basically ch go there between uh, between classes and you know, do my tour and run back. Uh, mm -hmm. When I was a graduate student, it was a little bit uh, easier since I didn't have quite as many commitments as I uh, do now. But one of the things that I really do want to continue to do is be a docent. So even though the scheduling can be a little bit tricky sometimes, I'm usually doing one tour uh, a week. Yeah. Okay. I have to ask this of any person who deals sort of with the, the public and, and guided tours and things like that. Um, what's been the, the strangest experience, perhaps, while you were being a docent? Well, I guess you, you meet a lot of people from a lot of different places, and you have people come in with uh, a lot of different, I guess you could say, backgrounds. And some people are, I think they find everything new that you're talking about, and so that's kind of an interesting, there's sort of a tabla rasa, you can put in whatever information that you want. You have other people who have, uh, I guess, more background, and so you're giving them different information, maybe things that they didn't know. And then you have sometimes people who have sort of preconceived uh, ideas about things, and sometimes, sometimes those can be a little bit uh, tricky. Mm. Um, so the story that I'm thinking of, it happened a number of years ago. I had some visitors who insisted that, uh, and I'm not sure where they were from, they were not from Hawaii, but they insisted that they had evidence that the Hawaiians had come from Africa. And they were very, very insistent uh, about this, and it was a little bit difficult to sort of uh, work around their persistence okay. on this issue. So everybody's coming in with, I think, a different set of assumptions. Sometimes, usually, I think those assumptions are fairly accurate, but these folks uh, <laughs> had some interesting <laughs> ideas. Okay, I mean, because there's always these theories about. Yeah, there are, there. And, and I think there's certainly a, a certain amount of debate going on. Mm. Uh, but these these people seem very certain about their uh, their theory. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, well, it's interesting. Um, not to put you on the spot, but I mean, since you did both Spanish and Hawaiian research, I mean, there's that kind of persistent theory, right? That you know whether or not the uh, Spanish treasure ships that mm, were going mm, across mm, the Pacific, mm, if they ever had contact, right, uh, right pre right. pre Captain Cook. I mean, right, is that something right. you put well, a lot of? I'm going to say the safe answer to that is probably we will never know. Mm. Uh, but there is some evidence of that. There is uh, certainly, I think, a, the context, which is the Spanish ships were traveling throughout the Pacific, and there were Spanish uh, territories in Guam and in other places in the Pacific as well, and they were traveling between Asia and their colonies in Latin America. So it isn't something, I think, that would be completely out of uh, 
it wouldn't be an entirely wouldn't be an entirely be a surprise. But as to whether there's specific evidence about that, uh, then there is there is some stuff about that. But I don't know that there's enough to definitively uh, to definitively say that the Spanish were here. One of the ways I try to address that to say is even if they were, they certainly didn't have the impact, the international impact that Cook did when he arrived mm. here in 1778. So it is perhaps an interesting historical uh, fact, and there are some interesting. Uh, bits of evidence like the Hawaiians, for instance, having iron when Captain Cook arrived and being aware of it, which could be a sign that they had maybe some contact with uh, outsiders. On the other hand, there's a lot of drift drift right. from the ocean, so that could be a, another explanation as well. So maybe someday we will find, uh, find some additional information. I know people have gone to uh, the archives in Spain, actually, mm. to look at some of the journals of the uh, ship captains and such, and I don't think, though, there's been any definitive uh, solution yet. Okay, I thought yeah. perhaps maybe a future project. A future project. <laughs> that, that's a possibility. Research, that is a possibility. Uh, yep. Okay, interesting. Um, if you're thinking about one thing that I find interesting about the work that you do is that it's a it's a very nice well I find a nice synergistic sort of combination that you mm. do that you've got the research in Hawaii, uh, you're you're talking to students about Hawaiian history and then you're doing these docent tours right. and you find innovative ways to put them together. I mean, you, right, take, you do right, study right. tours to the palace with, with right. your students as well, right. right? So yeah, one of the things that I do for my classes is try to bring them on as many field trips as possible. And so certainly we make the palace one of the highlights uh, of that, one of the great uh, advantages, I think, of Hawaii Pacific University is its geographic location. Mm. We're right, we're right in the heat of uh, downtown, in the middle of everything, and so many of the events that we actually talk about in class in Hawaiian history happened uh, within walking distance, and so that makes a trip to the palace certainly logistically feasible. In addition to being really an interesting component of the course content. What are this, like, if the students kind of go to the palace? I mean, what's what's sort of for you as your with your observations? What's the the thing they find most of interest or most surprising? I think a lot of people are surprised about how westernized the monarchy was mm. and how westernized the palace was. And it's part of the king's sort of mission to show to the entire world that Hawaii was uh, on par with the, some of the great powers. And so sometimes students are sort of surprised when we go in there and say, who are all these European people who are uh, being depicted in the palace? Many mm. of the state portraits that are in the palace of foreign rulers or of other uh, foreign notables, and I think that students and even other visitors are very surprised at the number of uh, Western uh, Western objects, but then also Western symbols that are in the palace as well. One thing that strikes me when I, uh, the first time I, I went on a tour many years ago is, as you said, I mean there are portraits of people, and some are, are in a sense kind of obvious, right? right, heads of state. So even though there were, say, tensions between the Hawaiian monarchy and the, and the kingdom and then the Republic of France in the 19th century, mm. you know, it's a big portrait of Louis Philippe. There. Right, right. Uh, so that, yeah, it makes sense because, you know, he's a head of state at the same time right. and things. Uh, but a couple of the ones surprised me, like there's a portrait, I believe, of Field Marshal Blucher, yes. the, the Prushan general right, from right. Waterloo. Right, What's do you know, <laughs> what, is the, what is the story with that? What's the story that? on Blucher? Well, one, one sort of connection to today is actually this is the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. So that's not why the painting is oh. in the palace, but that is how, uh, for, uh, how <laughs> full of foresight. <laughs> exactly, that they would they would know that the painting would be there for the 200th anniversary. That painting actually came with uh, Frederick William III, who was the king of Prussia mm -hmm. at the time, and Blucher was his favorite field marshal. And so when he sent gifts to the Hawaiian kingdom, he sent not only a portrait of himself, but also a portrait of his favorite marshal, along with some other. Uh, Prussian objects like uniforms and maps and those sorts of things and so mm. it wasn't necessarily because of a specific Hawaii connection it was a, more the personal preference of uh, the Prussian king to send to send that that painting. Okay, that's one that always sort of high, <laughs> I, I saw that and I thought, okay, that didn't really make any yeah. obvious sense to myself. Um, so we've got some more um, photos uh, that are up. Okay. Oh, okay, right. Yes, this is uh, Blucher at Waterloo. Then. Oh, okay, yes. okay. There we go. <laughs> so uh, that was certainly a connection, although there no, was... It looks like Wellington, though. Is that Wellington, I think? Yeah, the British flag the there... British flag I... might be Wellington. Yeah. 
maybe a general scene of the battle. General scene of Waterloo. Yes, a general go. scene of the battle. So <laughs> it is something that sometimes when you have visitors from Europe, you can sort of point out things mm. uh, like that because uh, they're always very surprised, too. Our local residents are surprised, but I think our foreign visitors are surprised. And that's one of the things I like to do is to point out to people uh, from different countries uh, what sort of objects in the palace there might be from uh, their home country. And they're oftentimes very excited about that and you know, they're taking pictures and posting them online to show that they saw you know, a royal order from Denmark in the mm. throne room, uh, something they may not have expected. What's one that for you stands out in some of your tours that you've given an object where somebody from a very sort of place that seemingly might not have much to do with Hawaii, uh, you were able to show an object or something of interest? Well, I think one of the objects is actually in our basement gallery. So in our basement gallery, we have a lot of the different royal orders. And I think the royal orders are something that uh, really show Hawaii's international connections during oh. the 19th century. And we have royal orders that were given to not only the Hawaiian uh, monarch, but also mm -hmm. to Hawaiian government officials as they were going on uh, diplomatic missions and such. And we had uh, one from Serbia. And so oh. a lot of times people are not thinking of connections between Hawaii and Serbia, but Eastern Europe did have connections with Hawaii as well. And there's even a letter uh, from uh, between the Hawaiian monarchy and the Romanian monarchy, for instance, on the death of uh, one of the members of the Romanian uh, of the Hawaiian royal family, a letter was sent to the king of Romania. So a lot of connections between, I guess you would say, more obscure sort of places, mm. uh, or at least not the great major powers of the 19th century. So maybe we're not surprised about Hawaii's connections with England or with France, but maybe a little bit more uh, interesting to think about Hawaii's connections with some of the smaller um, nations around the world in the 19th century. Mm. Well, I think a lot of people are surprised you know, when they think about this. I mean, obviously the British uh, and then the French uh, influence, but I mean, you know, the Russians in you know the early part of the 19th mm -hmm. century had a very large specific presence, and, right, and things. Right, some right. of the forts, you know, Kauai right. and other areas were built originally by the, by the when the Russians came. And right. Things that, well, I certainly think that when we think about the 19th century, we have to rem remind ourselves that Hawaii was actually a center of trade in the Pacific and, f and was much more developed, for instance, than California would have been in the early 19th century. And so when you think about the Russians coming out here and supplying, they wanted to get supplies for their, um, their outposts in California and Alaska, and they came to Hawaii to do that. Mm. So we think of everything sort of coming into Hawaii from outside and that we're supplied by the outside, but actually Hawaii supplied uh, the West Coast and other places in the world uh, back in the 19th century. Interesting, and yeah. kind of ro reversal of your sort yeah, of Yeah, exactly, exactly. And some of the things that we maybe aren't, uh, aren't aware about Hawaii's um, status in the 19th century. We have a, I think we have a photo here of the barracks and the Royal Guard. Okay, yeah. so this is a photo of the Royal Barracks from the monarchy period. And one of the things I can mention about this photo is that when uh, the ceremonies will be held on Monday the 16th. We will see uh, Hawaiian and part Hawaiian members of our Hawaii Air National Guard, and they will be wearing uniforms that are very similar to what you can see there. So that is the Royal Household uh, Guard from the monarchy period, and you'll really have living history if you go and see that event and you see the uh, soldiers wearing the uniforms that are replicas of the 19th century uh, Hawaiian military uniforms. Interesting. All right, well, we're going to take a break for a commercial here, and we'll be right back and continue our conversation about Hawaiian history with Doug Aspen. Great. Hi, my name is Hilary Weinberg. I'm the host of The Whole Gamut on Think Tech Hawaii. See us live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. or on our YouTube channel to hear us talk about world affairs from Hawaii and beyond. See you then. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. 
Hello and welcome to Global Connections. I'm Patrick Bratton filling in to Carlos Juarez on ThinkTech TV. And we're here because of Jay Fidel and his great crew uh, talking with Doug Asman about Hawaiian history and the Hawaiian monarchy. Just before our break, um, we had been looking at a photo of the Royal Guard in front of the barracks. And people today know the barracks as the place that they go and get their entrance tickets. Right. And it's the gift shop right, for the palace. Right, right. But there's something kind of funny about the location yes, of, the, of the barracks, yes. right? So the barracks is the original building, or most of the original building. But in the monarchy period, that building was actually uh, behind the palace, about where maybe the state capital uh, is today. And so when the state capital was built, there had to be a, a switch. The building had to be moved, and it was actually taken apart. Its uh, various parts were then numbered and labeled, and then it was rebuilt where it exists today. So it is the original building, but it's not actually in the original uh, location that it was in the monarchy period and that around that spot in the monarchy period was actually a bungalow a royal bungalow that was pink in okay. color uh, and Kalaka was spent a lot of time uh, in that smaller building avoiding sort of all the royal protocol that was associated with the palace but as many Hawaii residents know termites are a problem <laughs> and that building was torn down in 1919 because of termite damage but at least it left us a spot to be able to put the uh, Royal Barracks building up there. One of the things, though, one of my, not, not you, but one of my previous docents at the, one of my visits said that, you know, Kalakaua didn't live really in the palace mm. except on state occasions. Mm. They lived in the bungalow, is that correct? They, the royal family had residences throughout the islands, not mm. only on this island, but and not only in downtown Honolulu as well. And so the palace was associated with a certain amount of protocol. And so the royal family did spend a lot of time uh, not in the palace, you know, for instance, maybe in the bungalow building. Uh, Lili'uokalani, who was the last monarch of the Kingdom of Hawaii, spent a lot of time in Washington Place, which mm. was her uh, husband's family's home, and she spent actually a lot more time uh, there than she did in Iolani Palace. Mm. And so there are royal connections to a lot of different buildings that uh, are not the palace. Okay. Interesting. Talking a little bit about the palace, I mean, one of the things, the challenges, you mentioned termites in Hawaii, right. but um, given that the uh, the palace had been used for sort of um, civic government yes, yes. Uh, back in the 1950s before the state capital was built, I mean, it's been a big sort of a huge effort or a labor sure, of love uh, sure. to get the palace up to the state that we see today. Yes, yes, yes. And so after the overthrow of the monarchy, the palace was essentially used as a government uh, building. It was a small building to house the different offices of, for instance, the territorial government. So a lot of changes, uh, we might call them unfortunate changes today, happened in the palace during the uh, post-monarchy period, and that really necessitated some major uh, restoration work to bring the palace back to the appearance that it had during the monarchy period. Uh, we've got some photos that you've taken that are and also some historical photos of Perhaps if we could maybe look at uh, what the, it's the Golden Room, right? Uh, the, the Gold Room, it might room. be the Gold Room. Let's see what we have. The Throne Room. The thro okay, here's the Throne Room. And this is for, uh, I believe this is for the, either for the Coronation or the Jubilee. I, you can see there that many of the objects that were given to the king mm -hmm. uh, were placed in the Throne Room. And it gives us a sense of the way that room looked uh, during the monarchy period. And if we look there at some of the uh, electrical features, or actually I should say that's the gas features, uh, when the palace was electrified in 1887, um, the gas fixtures were taken out and electricity was put in. So one of the ways that we can date some of these photos is looking at some of the uh, of the hardware, so to speak. And so mm. here you can see that this is a before 1887 photo because of the uh, lighting fixtures or the gas ones. And many of these objects that we can see in the throne room in this photo are in the palace uh, today, including the two tusks that you can see between the thrones that were a gift to the king from the prime minister of oh. Hawaii, yeah, Walter yeah. Murray Gibson. Oh, interesting. And I mean, I assume these things were not kept in the palace for no. years. So people, <laughs> how have they gotten these objects back? So one of the tragedies of the uh, post-monarchy period was that the government sold a lot of the furnishings that were in the palace. And of course, they wanted to raise money, but they also wanted to eliminate signs and vestiges of the monarchy. So the Friends of Iolani Palace Organization has been uh, engaged in a decades-long quest to sort of bring things back to the palace. And we've had quite a bit of uh, success with that as you look at some of those historic mm. photos. And if you make a visit to the palace, you will be able to see that a lot of the artifacts that left after the overthrow of the monarchy are actually 
uh, back in the palace today. Okay. And then you have, uh, I think, a, a more uh, a, a photo that you've taken yes. as well. Uh, that gives of the us throne a, room. Throne yeah. room. So here we can see the uh, throne room as it looks today. And if you remember that historic photo, it looks very similar. There aren't quite as many objects in the, uh, in the photograph because all of those gifts aren't uh, being displayed. But you can see that a lot of effort and time and money has gone into uh, restoring the palace to its monarchy era appearance. And as you can see from the photo, the chandeliers, if you were able to get a glimpse of that other photo, are different uh, from the ones that you can see here, the electric-powered uh, uh, chandeliers that were installed in 1887 when electricity was put in. Anything, uh, if you're looking here as well, sort of a, to explain to our viewers some mm -hmm. of the symbols, the monarchy? The sure. So you can see certainly some Western symbols that you can uh, see in the photograph, including the two thrones that were uh, ordered by Kalaka before the palace. And uh, even though a lot of the objects were uh, taken after the overthrow of the monarchy, these thrones were sent to the Bishop Museum. And so some of the most important symbols and objects of the monarchy were uh, not sold off, and these have come back now to the palace for display. And even that fabric that you can see on the throne chairs, mm -hmm. that's the original fabric from the time of the monarchy. So even though a lot of things have had to have been uh, restored and mm -hmm. regilded and such, the fabric on the throne chairs is original. Okay. Uh, we can also see some of the ancient. So we talk a lot about Western symbols, mm -hmm. and sometimes people are uh, perhaps taken aback a little by the fact that there seem to be so few Hawaiian symbols. So we can see, actually, in this photograph, two very important Hawaiian symbols. Uh, between the two thrones is a pulo ulo'u, or a kapu stick. Mm -hmm. And that was an ancient symbol of Hawaiian royalty. Uh, they were placed in front of royal residences. They were sometimes also carried in front of the ali'i as well. And this one is a a gift. It was a gift to the king from a ship captain, and that staff is made from a narwhal tusk. Oh. So talking about Hawaii's international connections, or at least things that are in the palace that are from uh, exotic places, that is actually well, the unicorn whale that you may have seen mm. in photographs, sometimes they battle with their uh, tusks, and that's actually what the pulo'olo is made out of. Quite interesting. I mean, it's just, I'm always struck by the amount of work that must have gone in to this continuing yeah. restoration that's been right. done and the, and the work that has been done um, by the friends of the of the palace. I mean, right. is that something as well in addition to your, your docent duties that you've been involved in or? Yeah, I've helped with different events and also with uh, some of the research that has happened, but a lot of the work that's done is uh, through volunteers and all of the docents at Iolani Palace are volunteers and many people are uh, helping the palace to um, locate artifacts and to do research on historical artifacts and so much of that was done during the initial restoration process in the 1970s it's hard to I think calculate how many thousands and thousands of hours that the friends of Iolani Palace and also vo other volunteers have put into really bringing the palace to the grandeur of the Kalakaua dynasty. I mean the palace uh sort of uh, takes a center stage when you're, when you're downtown, you're looking around right. for sort of Hawaiian history. But one thing I'm always uh, struck with is the, there's a whole bunch of sites downtown. Sure, sure. And things that uh, people walk by every day and not yeah. even uh, are where I do some sort of historical walking towards downtown. And I'm, I'll catch people who walk the same route every day to work and not know that this building or this, this place is important. What are some ones around uh, downtown that you routinely use for your, for your, for your study tours and your, and your walks that, you, that people don't, might not appreciate, that are, some of our viewers might be able to check out themselves as they're? Well, I think a lot of times when you live in a place, you always think that you can go and visit the historic sites a little bit later, and then that sort of gets pushed <laughs> off, and then you end up never visiting them. And I, it always surprises me how many Hawaii residents come on palace tours and tell me that they have never been to the palace or the last time they were in the palace was when they were in the fourth grade and they did their Hawaiian history segments. So there are certainly a lot of things that you can see downtown, certainly within the uh, vicinity of the palace. Mm -hmm. Right across the street, of course, is the statue of Kamehameha I that mm -hmm. was uh, put up during the Kalakaua dynasty. And right behind that, Ali'iola Nehale, or our judiciary building, is also an extremely historic building. Uh, it's actually older than the palace, and it was begun during the reign of Kamehameha V and finished during Kalakaua's time. But in that building was the kingdom's parliament, 
and Supreme Court as well. And our Hawaii State Supreme Court is still on the second floor of that building. And also very important historically, it was at the back of that building that the monarchy was overthrown in January of 1893. And so an addition was put in a little bit later. Uh, so it's, the atmosphere is perhaps a little bit different. It's a hallway now um, at the back of the building, but there's certainly a lot of living history happening in the vicinity within just a few, uh, a few steps of the palace. So Ali'i Ola Nehele, I think, is certainly a building that you can check out. It is open to the public. Uh, there is a museum in there that talks about law and also about the World War II period and some of the interesting things that were happening in Hawaii during martial law. So right, that's another the, the place martial to check law out. exhibit. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Now, that building, um, I was always I'm with a historian, so I have to check what I'm what I'm saying if I say uh, things that are wrong. But that building originally was supposed to be the palace, right? But then. Yes, the original Iolani, the first Iolani Palace uh, had become quite dilapidated by, uh, by even the, toward the end of the Kamehameha Dynasty, and there were plans to uh, build a new palace. There were also plans to create a new government building as well for the ministries and the parliament and such. And the king decided, Kamehameha V decided, that the government building should take priority. So Ali'i Ola Nehale, the original plan was it for, for it to be the palace, and then the plans were modified for a uh, government building. So although it never was a palace, it, there was the intention that uh, the building, at least in a modified form, would be the palace. So it took a few years before uh, the new Iolani Palace that we see today uh, was built. But yes, that was, it also has a palace connection. Interesting. Do you have a favorite area, maybe downtown or on Oahu, that really for you, when you walk, you really get a sense, uh, a sense of place, a sense of history uh, when, when, when you're going around. I mean, for me, uh, Merchant Street is always mm. there with the Stengenwald building, sure. Alexander Baldwin building. You get this sense of what Honolulu, for me, what Honolulu must have looked like in the 1920s or, sure. or something. Do you have an area that you kind of like going, gives you kind of a, a, a glimpse into the past, if you will? Or would that be the palace for you? Or? Well, I think if you walk down King Street around the, around the area of the palace and you look to either side, you can really see Hawaii's history sort of come uh, come to life with the historic buildings, the palace, the uh, Li'iola Nehale within just a block or so. You also have the historic Kwaihao Church mm. and the mission houses that are also uh, there and even our city hall if you're thinking more of a 20th century history. And so you think you can see everything from the early 19th century into the 20th century within like a block or two right in downtown Honolulu on King Street. So I think that's a sort of a favorite walk for me is that couple of uh, blocks around the palace on King Street. Other than the palace, do you have a favorite building downtown? Favorite building downtown? I think Kwai Hao Church is certainly mm. one of my uh, favorites. It's uh, older, of course, than the palace, but it's a bit of the sort of pre, uh, pre Kalakaua dynasty history. So we can see the influence of the missionaries and also influence of the monarchy as well, royal pews and such mm. that are in the church. And so that's certainly one of uh, my favorites. Sometimes it's called the Westminster Abbey of Hawaii, <laughs> a little bit maybe of a smaller version of it. Mm. And there's also a royal tomb, actually. King Lunalilo's tomb is on the grounds of Kwaihao Church. So a lot of monarchy connections are also uh, found on that property. Looking forward, uh, what what would be your what's your sort of next research project or next thing dealing with Hawaiian history you're you're looking forward to or maybe you may be working on already? Well, one of the things I want to look at is uh, the king's last trip. So the king actually died in San Francisco in 1891 and he had traveled there to try to improve his health. And one of the issues that I want to be looking at is uh, the reactions to uh, his trip, his last trip to the United States. And sometimes we forget that he was the first monarch to visit the United States, and it was a big deal uh, in the United States in the 1870s. But he was talked about all in the American papers and such, and so it really, I think, brings to light the importance of Hawaii as an independent nation in the 19th century. All right, well, thank you very much. I think myself and all of our viewers, we've learned a great deal uh, about Hawaiian history, and hopefully people will uh, pay attention to what's going on with the Jubilee and have visit on its on maybe November on Monday, 16th. November 16th is coming Monday, starting around 1130 and lasting for about an hour or so. All right, excellent. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for joining us, uh, Doug. It's always a pleasure to talk with you and, and learn things. And I just want to say thank you to Jay and Zuri and everybody here at uh, Think Tank for making this possible. I'm Patrick Bratton for Global Connections, and I will see you next week.